Kitanese painter, not Han Chinese that is, who was active in the early 10th century. Um, it's a painting that has early colophones or early inscriptions uh, going back to the first one is 1145, mid 12th century. Uh, it's in the Palace Museum, the National Palace Museum in Taipei, but absolutely no attention paid to it. They have exhibitions of early painting, it isn't there. They publish books on early painting, it isn't there, and so on. I've been going about touting this painting for a long time, uh, but nobody pays any attention. It just doesn't look like a great Chinese painting. Okay. Uh, Cao Xingyuan, my wife, gave a paper on it at a conference organized in Hohat in Inner Mongolia, organized by our mainly by our friend Emmy Munker. And uh, Xingyuan's paper was published afterwards in one Wu magazine, uh, Cultural Properties magazine. So far as I know, nobody else has paid much attention to the scroll. I use it often in lectures. I talk about it. I reproduce a section of it in one of my books and so on. Well, here is, a, I don't have detail, I don't have sides of the whole scroll. I have three uh, details or sections. Here near the beginning of the scroll is a gate in the pass you set in the upper part here, and a procession of people carrying banners about to make their way through this gate. It might be a pass that leads into the Chinese territory between the space of the Khitan or Liao dynasty and the Chinese. Uh, there was a lot of back and forth going on, uh, emissaries and so on, and uh, commerce between the Chinese territory and the Liao. So that may be what's happening here. They're on their way out to, to confront the Sung or whatever. Um, and it's a rather bleak picture. The uh, landscape parts are done in the same system, uh, repeated contours and uh, 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 informal shading or loose brush strokes to shade from one to the next, shaping the earth masses in the same way. Somewhat damaged, but not so bad for a painting which I believe to be really of the uh, 10th or 11th century. Bare trees and such. The next, please. Uh, here are the, another slide from the scroll. I don't have the slides of the whole scroll, as I say, but this is a large section of it, showing a landscape that stretches off more or less flat into the distance, only with rises of earth, drawn with contour lines repeated, going back shaded from one to the next into the far distance. This is like the grassland that you see, in fact, in the northern areas of China where the Liao people lived. Uh, very much like what we saw when Xingyuan and I made a, a uh, journey uh, outing from the uh, Hohat, where the conference was up into the grasslands. Well, they, they, they it doesn't have the grass here. It looks rather bleak, but in fact it's flat like this and so on. Uh, and over this is spread all the uh, interesting detail of the this part of the painting. That is, um, the um, horses and camels uh, used by the Liao people, uh, the, the warriors themselves, number of them seen, a group of geese over here, uh, and beyond a, uh, a a hut. Actually, hut is a word we take not from pitons but from Mongols. Yurt. Anyway, it's a it's a Mongol word originally. But the hut, I mean, a uh, construction of a kind that you can knock down and carry along with you, such as the nomadic people took with them when they traveled. And um, anyway, I'll, I'll spread across the landscape all these details, much as they would be, might be in a Tang painting. We have things sort of like this from Dunhuang and other Tang compositions. It's interesting also that the contour lines overlap some of the figures. They are seen in part over the tops of these, uh, of these uh, lines. This is another Tang feature. I've seen some Tang, tang attributed paintings. Uh, while the, the Liao people were very proud of continuing Tang uh, traditions in their art and culture, uh, cult, cult, uh, cult traditions that had been dropped elsewhere, they, continued, they considered themselves, that is, to be the real heirs to the Tang dynasty. So anyway, this is the, um, uh, the main part of the scroll. Uh, very strange and not like other Chinese paintings that we have of the time and looking rather bleak like the landscape, but also probably bleak to the people who look at the scroll, most of them. And then finally, uh, next slide please. Here are the last slide of uh, this lecture with a uh, earth mass or a kind of rocky mass rising from the plain, 
uh, in, uh, in the middle distance uh, sh shaped again and uh, with uh, ink strokes. And then a pair of camels here in the lower right paired, one facing in, one out. We see this kind of pairing often in tong and tong-like compositions. And then two warriors lying on the ground with a uh, banner or a flag up there. Um, Xing Yuan found in the painting uh, details that uh, could only be matched actually in the uh, pieces, objects that have been found in recent excavations of Liao tombs. There have been a lot of excavating of Liao tombs, hundreds of them in the, in the north. M many of them looted, some of them with uh, pr pr producing paintings like the, well, the two we saw earlier in this lecture. At any rate, uh, in, the, in this painting are details such as a belt with appendages that matched perfectly the objects in recent excavations in which the artist could not have known except through a uh, first-hand intimate knowledge of Liao culture. So that again confirms the, uh, the uh, attribution of this to a Liao artist, who, whether it's Hu Gui or somebody else, we don't know. That's, uh, but, but at any rate, it's a very early and important painting and a quite neglected painting. Okay, and with that I end this lecture. The one that will follow, Lecture 6, is going to deal with works ascribed to the great landscape masters of the Five Dynasties. That is the same period we've been looking at, but ascribed mostly with shaky evidence. A very different group from what we've seen in this lecture, which has mostly been paintings that are either from the Five Dynasties or, I think, reliably after Five Dynasties paintings. But these works ascribed to the great masters that will be in Lecture 6 are important also in their own way for understanding the great development of landscape painting that follows as we move into the Sung Dynasty uh, and leaves behind much of what we've seen in this lecture, as I say. This is not really followed up. You can't find much of anything like it in Sung. Even a painting like the Qingming Shang He Tu of architecture and so on it has a few places where you look into buildings, but nothing like what we've seen. We will also move further into the realm of what can be called pure landscape, in which human subjects are highly conventionalized or absent altogether. That has not been true of any of the paintings that were considered in this lecture. Even when they offered well-developed landscape settings that occupied a lot of our attention, they all had prominent human themes, a man entering a Taoist paradise, or a famous scholar and his wife living in seclusion, or the lives of fishermen on the river. That will no longer be true of some of the landscapes that we're going to see in the next lecture. In that sense, too, we will be witnessing then a major new development in our principal theme, Chinese landscape painting. Okay, so much for today.